Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Elaine here, and in this lecture we will look at art from the Baroque period in Italy and Spain. Take good notes, and let's begin. Baroque art key ideas include that art during the Baroque period is influenced by the Counter-Reformation, symbolized the Catholic resurgence after the Protestant Reformation. Let's review those two reforms. The Protestant Reformation was a 16th century religious, political, intellectual, and cultural upheaval that splintered Europe, Catholic Europe, setting in place the structures and beliefs that would define the continent in the modern era. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church was slow to respond systematically to the theological and publicity innovations of Luther and the other reformers. The Council of Trent which met off and on from 1545 through 1563, articulated the church's answer to the problems that triggered the Reformation and to the reformers themselves. Catholic Baroque art ultimately aimed to energize believers. Next, Baroque art flourished in Holland and became the voice to counter Catholic art. Baroque can be separated into two schools, the Classicist, influenced by Raphael, and the Naturalist, inspired by Titian. Lastly, Baroque architecture is associated with the grand and majestic royal courts. Here is a list of the artworks that we will be analyzing. Here is a list of our key terms. With the Catholic Church as the leading art patron in 17th century Italy, the aim of much of Italian Baroque art was to restore Roman Catholicism's predominance and centrality. The first artist we will look at is working from Italy. Bernini was a sculptor and architect. He was also a devout Catholic, which undoubtedly contributed to his understandings of those goals. His inventiveness, technical skill, sensitivity to his patron's needs, and energy made him the quintessential Italian Baroque artist. Here we see two different versions of the David statue. On the Renaissance side, words that can describe this statue include serenity, eternal, stability, horizontals slash verticals, calm nobility, more reserved slash distant, idealized, uninterrupted contours, and clear and even light. Words that can describe the Baroque statue of David are emotional intensity, a moment in time, dynamism, diagonals, energy and movement, involving slash close, real not idealized, interrupted contours, and effects of light. Let's look a little bit closer at Bernini's David. Here Bernini chose to represent the combat itself and aim to capture the split second of maximum action. The body armor at David's feet is the protection King Saul offered him, but that David rejected because he placed his faith in the Lord. A bag full of stones is at David's left hip, suggesting that he thought the fight would be tough and long. The Baroque statue seems to be moving through time and through space. The tension in David's face augments the dramatic impact of Bernini's sculpture. Another work displaying the motion and emotion that are hallmarks of Italian Baroque art is Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. 
For this commission, Bernini marshaled the full capabilities of architecture, sculpture, and painting to charge the entire chapel with palpable tension. The passionate drama of Bernini's depiction of St. Teresa correlated with the ideas of Ignatius Loyola. We argue that the recreation of spiritual experience would encourage devotion and piety. Bernini also drew on the considerable knowledge of the theater that he derived from writing plays and producing stage designs. Teresa's conversion occurred after the death of her father when she fell into a series of trances, saw visions, and heard voices. Feeling a persistent pain, she attributed it to the fire-tipped arrow of divine love that an angel had thrust repeatedly into her heart. In her writings, St. Teresa described this experience as making her swoon in delightful anguish. Feel free to read the description. Here, Bernini uses physical and sexual symbolism to represent the spiritual experience by means of a metaphor. Caravaggio, or Michelangelo Merisi, was an Italian painter who is considered one of the fathers of modern painting. Caravaggio was a controversial and influential Italian artist. He was orphaned at age 11 and apprenticed with a painter in Milan. He moved to Rome, where his work became popular for the tenebrinism technique he used, which used shadow to emphasize lighter areas. His career, however, was short-lived. Caravaggio killed a man during a brawl and fled to Rome. He died not long after, on July 18, 1610. Here's a short video you can check out about Caravaggio's life and art. Here we have Caravaggio's Calling of St. Matthew. Tenebrism is from the Italian word tenebrous or shadowy, which describes a strong contrast of light and shadow. The strong contrast of light and dark is a key feature of Caravaggio's style. Here, Christ, cloaked in mysterious shadow, summons Levi, the tax collector, or St. Matthew, to a higher calling. Caravaggio injected naturalism into the representation of sacred subjects, reducing them to human dramas played out in the harsh and dingy settings of his time and place. The unidealized figures that he selected from the fields and the streets of Italy, however, were effective precisely because of their familiarity. Here Caravaggio captures the moment of spiritual awakening. This is known as the conversion of Levi, who became Matthew, a tax collector, and was brought to his salvation. As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew 9.9 9. The figures are identified by light and gesture. Although Christ's extended arm is reminiscent of the Lord's and Michelangelo's creation of Adam, the position of his hand and wrist is similar to Adam's. This reference was highly appropriate because the church considered Christ to be the second Adam, where areas Adam was responsible for the fall of humankind, Christ is the vehicle of its redemption.
One of these was painted by a woman and the other by a man. Can you tell which one? The one on the left, if you guessed right, was painted by a woman. Her name was Chintileski. There you can see a strong sense of muscles. She's more fierce. And also the helper woman is more involved. If you look on the right side, that was painted by the artist Caravaggio. The women are different and a little bit more hesitant. Caravaggio's combination of naturalism and drama appealed both to patrons and to artists, and he had many followers. Among them was the most celebrated woman artist of the era, Artemisia Gentileschi, whose father, Orazio, her teacher, was himself strongly influenced by Caravaggio. The daughter's successful career pursued in Florence, Venice, Naples, and Rome helped disseminate Caravaggio's style throughout the peninsula. The painting we will look at by Artemisia is Judith slaying Holoferns. The town of Bethulia is under siege by the Assyrian army and about to give up. Judith dresses herself up to catch the eye of the Assyrian general and moves across enemy lines because she is seen as a traitor. The general gets drunk and falls asleep. Judith takes his sword and kills him with the assistance of her maid. Here's a link to an article titled More Savage Than Caravaggio, The Woman Who Took Revenge in Oil. Artemisia Gentileschi turned the horrors of her own life, repression, injustice, rape, into brutal biblical paintings that were also a war cry for oppressed women. Why has her extraordinary genius been overlooked? The dying man is Holofernes, an enemy of the Israelites in the Old Testament, and the young woman beheading him is Judith, his divinely appointed assassin. Yet, at the same time, he is also an Italian painter called Agostino Tassi, while the woman with the sword is Artemisia Gentileschi, who painted this. It is, effectively, a self-portrait. With words and images, she fought back against the male violence that dominated the world she lived in. The resulting rape trial against Augustino Tassi lasted seven months. Every word of this court case survives. The trial also featured months of meandering witness examinations, friends, tenants, artists, and relatives. Yet, Gentileschi was tortured and Tassi was set free. Why? He was protected by the Pope. By the 1620s, Artemisia was a successful artist working as far from Rome as she could get. In this painting, Gentileschi also adopted the tenebrism in what might be called the dark subject matter Caravaggio favored. After the beheading, they take the head, put it in a bag, and take it back to Bethulia to tell everyone that they are now safe. Judith beheading Holofernes became art history's favorite icon of female rage. Based on these events, one can see that Judith acquired relevance during periods of cultural upheaval. A straightforwardly virtuous characterization in the Middle Ages Judith became a warrior goddess in the service of political allegory in the Renaissance. The embodiment of female rage in the Baroque era in the textbook definition of a female in the late 19th century. It's not surprising that even in the 21st century, 
Judith still has something to say to modern audiences. Hers is the story of a woman who overpowers a much stronger enemy. Whether read through a feminist or political lens, the parable of the victorious underdog holds an underlying appeal. Our last stop will be Spain. Diego Velázquez was probably Spain's greatest Baroque artist. He was born in Seville in 1599. Between the ages of 11 and 16, he worked as an apprentice to the manners painter Francisco Pacheco. This was where he also gained the influences of Flemish and Italian realism. Velázquez traveled to Madrid in 1623 and painted the portrait of King Philip IV, which is now on display in the Prado Museum. After this, he was appointed the king's official painter. He spent the majority of the next six years painting portraits of the royal family. One of his most well-known paintings is Las Maninas, or the Maids of Honor. Here's a link to a video that does an in-depth analysis of the painting. This work, with its cunning contrast of real spaces, mirrored spaces, picture spaces, and pictures within pictures, itself appears to have been taken from a large mirror reflecting the entire scene. In 1656, Velázquez painted his greatest work, The Maids of Honor. The setting is the artist studio and the palace of the official royal residence in Madrid. The painter represented himself standing before a large canvas. The young princess, Margarita, appears in the foreground with her two maids in waiting, her favorite dwarfs and a large dog. In the middle ground are, are a woman in widow's attire and a male escort. In the background, a chamberlain stands in a brightly lit open doorway. Scholars have been able to identify everyone in the room, including the two Meninas and the dwarfs. Velazquez intended this huge and complex work with its cunning contrast of real mirrored and picture spaces to elevate both himself and the profession of painting in the eyes of Philip IV. What is Velázquez depicting on the huge canvas in front of him? He may be painting this very picture, an informal image of the Infanta and her entourage. Alternately, Velázquez may be painting a portrait of King Philip IV and Queen Mariana, whose reflections appear in the mirror on the far wall. If so, that would suggest the presence of the king and queen in a viewer's space, outside the confines of the picture. Other scholars have proposed that the mirror image is not a reflection of the royal couple standing in Velázquez's studio, but a reflection of the portrait the artist is in the process of painting on the canvas before him. This question will probably never be definitely resolved. Thanks for watching everyone. Here are some additional resources for you to access.